This is the second video of the accessory structures of the integumentary system. If you have not watched part one yet, you definitely want to go back and watch part one before proceeding with this video. And this one we're going to pick up with skin glands. There's a couple different type of specific glands in uh, the integumentary system. Uh, we're going to talk about each of these in detail shortly. Um, but the first one is sebaceous glands. The second one would be sweat glands, which are also known as sudoriferous glands. And then the third being ceruminous glands. Before we get going much further, there's different classifications of glands. They can be merocrine, apocrine, and holocrine. And if we look at these pictures, it kind of um, illustrates the difference between each. It has to do with how whatever the glands secrete, uh, they look at how the glands secrete things into the duct, which then goes to whatever they're going to, surface of the skin, hair, etc. Um, looking at merocrine, we can see these red dots. That's what is being secreted. In the case of merocrine glands, the contents being secreted is produced by cells and it goes straight into the ductwork of the gland, which would then go outward. With apocrine, we can see chunks of the cell enclosing the red dots, being kind of pinched off of these cells into the ductwork. And as these are being pushed upwards, we can see that the little vesicles or things that are containing the uh, secretions, they start to break down, releasing the red dots or secretions. And with holocrine, we can see that entire cells are being removed into the ductwork, and slowly the cells themselves are being broken down, releasing the secretions into the ductwork, which would then continue the way up. So we have merocrine, apocrine, holocrine. They're all very similar, yet they're different in how their secretions are actually released by the cells themselves. So moving forward, we're going to look at sebaceous glands first. Uh, sebaceous glands, they're specialized epidermal cells, um, very similar to uh, what we were looking at with the skin and uh, with the hair and with the nails. Um, sebaceous glands tend to be associated with hair follicles. Um, the reason for this is sebaceous glands secrete sebum, which is hair oil. These are a form of a holocrine gland, so we have an entire cell being put into the ductwork, which then contains a secretion and then it's broken down, releasing the secretion along the way. Um, the purpose of these glands is to keep our hair um, oiled, which is actually a form of protection because when hair gets dry, it starts to get split ends, it becomes a little bit weaker, a little bit more brittle. Um, so the purpose of sebum is to really keep our hair soft, moisturized, um, and that sort of material. So as I just kind of mentioned, sebum, um, it does keep the hair soft and pliable and waterproof. Um, however, too much sebum can result in acne, which is well, not necessarily bad, but it's not desirable to say the least. Um, so a little bit about sebum. Locations, as mentioned, tend to be attached directly to uh, hair. and Therefore, sebaceous glands can be found anywhere that hair is found. Um, we tend not to see hair on the palms or soles of the feet, so you wouldn't expect to see sebaceous glands there. Um, sometimes, sebaceous glands, they can open directly to the surface of the skin, which is similar to a sweat gland, um, but in most cases, they do attach to a hair to secrete that oil. Uh, some examples of places where you would find these glands that open directly to the surface would be on our lips and the corners of our mouth. So let's check out a sebaceous gland in this picture. We can see a hair follicle right here. We spoke about those previously. Here we see the sebaceous gland. It's within the dermis and it does attach directly to a hair follicle to oil and moisturize the hair before it um, penetrates the surface of the epidermis. Next type of gland we're going to be looking at are sweat glands or sudoriferous glands. Um, 
you can probably guess the purpose of these glands is to sweat, which is a um, form of homeostasis in terms of body temperature. These ones are uh, found all over our skin, and as we can see in this picture here, they uh, originate in the dermis, and they're kind of a coiled, tangled ball with a single duct that extends upward through the dermis and goes through the epidermis directly to the surface of the skin. The opening that we see on the top would be what we call a sweat pore. Um, sometimes sweat pores can become clogged with excessive oil from uh, the sebaceous glands, resulting in, you know, once again, acne. Looking back at our three classifications of glands, merocrine, apocrine, and holocrine, uh, sweat glands tend to be either ecrine or apocrine in nature. Now, ecrine is not listed here. Ecrine is not listed here. The difference between ecrine and apocrine is that ecrine sweat glands, these would go directly to the surface of the skin, um, just like we saw in this picture right here. So this sweat gland would be an ecrine gland because it goes directly to the surface of the skin. Whereas apocrine sweat glands, they actually attach to a hair similar to sebaceous glands. Um, the more common one would be the ecrine glands. However, both of these, ecrine and apocrine, they both secrete substances in this fashion here with bits of the um, cell being pinched off, releasing the sweat, which would be the secretion um, as the pinched off vesicle travels upward through the tube. The largest concentration of the ecrine sweat glands, once again, ecrine opens directly to the surface of the skin, will be found in the forehead, neck, and back which kind of makes sense because when we start to sweat, those are the places that we start sweating um, kind of first. Um, so they, they do kind of help us control body temperature. And as mentioned, the ecrine are more common than the apocrine. Apocrine sweat glands, they also um, play a role with homeostasis and body temperature. Here we see an apocrine sweat gland. It is actually similar to the ecrine that's coiled down in the dermis but here we see it attaching to a hair. These ones would be found in the uh, armpits and axillary regions, um, and they become largely active during puberty. Um, now when we sweat in our armpits, our armpits start to swell, not sweat, uh, smell not because of the sweat, but because there's bacteria there, and the bacteria uses the salts that are in our sweat to obtain energy. And as the bacteria break down that salt in the sweat, it produces an odor. Um, so these glands, they become active when a person is, in addition to exercising or at physically active, uh, upset, frightened, or in pain. And the last type of gland is known as a ceruminous gland uh, because it secretes, at least in the ear, a product known as cerumen. This is earwax. Um, as you know, earwax is kind of tacky and sticky, and it has a purpose, which is to trap debris as it kind of moves into the ear. Um, too much earwax can be a bad thing, but using Q-tips every day is ill-advised. You can actually uh, do more harm by cleaning out your ears daily than um, not. Um, Ceruminous glands are also specialized within the female mammary glands. Uh, these glands also secrete milk. So they are known as ceruminous glands because in both males and females, they secrete earwax, which is known as cerumen. But in females, they also are in the mammary glands and they secrete uh, milk. This concludes our discussion on the accessory structures. Moving forward, start thinking about how some of the different components uh, play a role in maintaining the functions of the integumentary system, namely homeostasis. Uh, so, for example, how would cerumen contribute to protection? We talked about cerumen trapping things that um, are in the air that might get in our ear that we don't want to. Um, so, thank you for listening. If you have any questions over this material, be sure to ask.